new orders of magnitude. I mean, I, I understand you to say that you actually don't need to make all of life from scratch. The key thing is just to make the code, because that then does the rest of the job for you. Exactly. Yeah, so that's, that's really fun. And are you using, it seems like part of the power of this is that you don't have to like, design one chromosome and then do it. Part of what you're doing is, is creating many designs at once and throwing them out there and seeing which ones work in a, in a right. controlled environment? Yeah, because the vastness of biology, right now with a 20 million gene data set, at the pace of science, uh, if 10,000 of those get understood in a decade with the way science is going to be really stunning, so we have to have these combinatorial approaches. We have to have the ability to do basically millions of experiments simultaneously using empiricism. But it's all the question you ask. If you just want to see what leads to a life form growing in these conditions, that's one question. But if you're screening for new derivatives of octane to be efficiently produced, starting with CO2, and you want to know that, you can optimize for that question as well. So, like all biology, it's based on selection, and it's based either on the natural environment that you're selecting for or the constraints and questions you put on it. So you're kind of creating your own Darwinian environment, throwing in lots of thousands, millions of competing designs, and seeing which superbug comes out of it that, whoa, this thing actually gobbles up CO2 and makes energy. I mean, that's going to be a big day for mankind, isn't it? If, when well, you find we, that one. We, we are doing that right now this year with Pathways. So we've, we've made a, we're working with a eukaryotic system where we just make one artificial chromosome with these synthesis pathways. Once you know the 50 genes that you want in, we have for each of those 50 genes, 10 to 100,000 different varieties. Uh, so we can substitute those in and try and optimize the system. So it's, biology is empirical at this stage because there is so much diversity. The combinatorial, computational aspects allow us to overcome that diversity. Fantastic. Question from the audience. Chris, questions. I saw this hand first. Case, I can make the case that you and your company are the most dangerous humans on planet Earth because just as you have opening up the door to wonderful aspects, weaponization through the same process could doom the human species. Is uh, that the, qu the question? That's the question. What do you guys do for security? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it is an important question, one that's been raised from the beginning, from the first bioethical review that suggested that we should go ahead uh, with the caveat. Uh, you know, fortunately, there's not that many people on our planet wanting to do harm with these tools. Uh, a part of a review funded by the Sloan Foundation with us at MIT uh, looked at this question and, uh, along with the government, decided very few biological agents that we work with uh, or even could be weaponized would people go to this route. Uh, there's 10,000 freezers around the world with hoof and mouth disease virus in it uh, that you wouldn't go to try and build the sophistication to do it. But it is an important issue. Uh, it, you know, uh, every new technology has the ability to be abused. You uh, had on your slide, you had an intriguing little label on one of the boxes that said suicide gene. Uh, well, what is that? Well, we build in various levels of security uh, with roughly 10 million experiments of people putting all kinds of different genes in E. coli over the last 30 years. There's never been one issue with it because the E. coli was modified and never to survive outside the lab. So we use those as starting positions, but uh, we uh, extra security is a suicide gene that if ever got out, you could easily trigger that and it would uh, kill the organism. So. But, but if what you're building is a 21st century version of page maker or something, so that in the natural consequence of all this is in 30 years' time, any grad student in their lab can build up on screen, I want this, 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 press a button, here's my super design, self-replicating, kill the human race bug. <laughs> aren't, you, aren't you creating the possibility for that to happen? Well, it's actually, fortunately, creating pathogens is probably one of the most difficult things. Out of the repertoire of probably uh, 50 million species on our planet, uh, it's only a few dozen that take any interest in us. Uh, and it, it's even hard to understand that. Uh, there are courses now at MIT and Berkeley uh, teaching these uh, methods, and some are advocating biohacking. I, I'm not advocating biohacking, uh, but part of what we're working uh, with various uh, groups on is 
we need new tools against emerging infections. It really doesn't matter whether they're man-made or not. Uh, we now, in, in this last year in this country, drug-resistant Staph aureus killed more people than HIV. Hmm. That's a new emerging infection. HIV was an emerging infection. SARS was an emerging infection. And I guarantee as we go from six and a half to nine billion people with increased poverty, we're going to have a lot of new emerging infections. So we need new antibiotics, new antivirals, and new vaccines. If we have those in abundance, it eliminates any threat of biological warfare. Okay, so your tools can work for the defense as fast as for the attack, yep. so to speak. We're going to have one more question. Is Larry Page, are you, are you, are you, do you have your hand up? Did I see that? Yeah. <laughs> I guess I, I'm interested in the, uh, how efficient you think the photosynthesis or the CO2-based uh, energy systems can be uh, based on life. Well, based, I mean, it's a good question and an important one. I mean, what we see with organisms like Methanococcus, CO2 is their source of carbon. So every bit of carbon in that cell is derived from CO2. What we see with plants is not very efficient. What we see with algae is much more efficient. So if we engineer algae uh, using sunlight and CO2 and engineer the organisms like Methanococcus, uh, we could actually use the combination of those to run day and night uh, in a pretty efficient fashion, capturing CO2. The limitation, interestingly, is going to be CO2 uh, for this process uh, because we can't just capture it out of the air. It's not high enough concentration. But CO2 sequestration, where people have been talking about dumping it into coal beds and oil beds, instead we think we can take that stream, uh, convert it back into fuel, uh, changing the equation in, in real time. So we need high concentrations of CO2 to drive this process. So it's, uh, uh, we need to drive the CO2 sequestration industry in parallel with this. So finally, Craig, I just wanted to ask almost a more personal question about how you, you know, think of your own legacy in this. I mean, you must lie awake some nights just thinking, you know, how, how did this happen? How, how was it me who was put in a position where potentially could, you know, materially alter the future of the human race, you know, create this new explosion of life forms, whatever. This is a big deal. I mean, how, uh, I don't how, how do you think of people. it? I don't people. I don't think those things. <laughs> <laughs> but that... <laughs> But, but, okay, so I mean, but when you I first... think about the potential of what we're trying to do, um, and, uh, you know, we were at Davos. I got very depressed being at Davos this year because it was clear most of the business executives that were there sort of buy into the CO2 issue as, as a pain for them. Uh, the consensus was nothing's going to change in the next 40 years because of vested interests. Um, it was pretty discouraging. So I, I, I worry much more whether these technologies and others that people here are developing can get out there in time to make a difference. We're playing a hell of an experiment with this planet that, that worries me more than any other aspect. So, so when uh, you first came to TED and I asked you, um, hey, um, um, couldn't you be accused of playing God? And you said, oh, we're not playing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was a great joke, you know, or was it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're not playing, for sure. Um, and I think it's part of the, the ethical review that we had. Most major religions were brought. And it's, it's part of most religions to actually play God. You're supposed to use your knowledge to improve uh, humanity. Uh, so I, I think it depends on who's making the accusation. If it's religions, then it's a good thing. Uh, but w we think this is, uh, this is science at its best, uh, not religion. Is, is there anything that the TED community can do to help you in your vision? Well, I think, uh, I mean, we have Al Gore here who's helped us all understand the, the importance of this uh, timing-wise. Uh, I think the one thing that could kill this are, are the ideas that were just mentioned, that this is... This is so scary, we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't try and solve these problems this way. Uh, I think public acceptance, uh, which is why I spend time talking to the public, is as important as the quality of the science. We saw that in Europe with GMOs. I, you know, I joke that Europeans now want DNA-free food. Um, <laughs> you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> you know, we, 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 need, we need real solutions. Um, I, I think if people listen to this pessimistic view that came out of Davos, uh, the urgency is not really there. Um, you know, we, we, we don't see it. And uh, I think that's how this community can help the most. Uh, Craig Venter, what you're doing is astonishing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you. It's unbelievable. Thank you.